Um, in part B of today's meeting, we meet with Mr. Omar Barghouti to discuss the current situation in Palestine and the growing non-violent civil society movement that opposes Israel's occupation. You're very welcome here today, uh, Mr. Barghouti. Before we begin, may I remind members, witnesses and those in the public gallery to ensure that their mobile phones are switched off completely for the duration of the meeting as they cause interference even on silent mode with the recording equipment in this committee room. Also I remind members of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person or body outside the houses or unofficially by name or in such ways to make him, her or it identifiable. By virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence joint committee. If they are directed by the Chair to cease giving evidence on a particular matter and continue to do so, they are entitled thereafter only to qualified privilege in respect of their evidence. They are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and they are asked to respect the parliamentary practice that where possible they should not criticise and make charges against any person or entity by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. I now call Dr Burguti to make your opening statement. Uh, thank you, sir. Good morning to you. Uh, I'm honoured to address your esteemed parliamentary committee and I'm grateful for this opportunity to share with you a glimpse of the Palestinian people's existence, resistance and inextinguishable insistence on freedom and self-determination after 70 years of colonial oppression. Like all Palestinians, I feel more at home in Ireland than in any other Western country. Your heroic struggle against centuries of colonialism has always inspired Palestinians. This is why I shall speak from the heart. At a time when Israel's regime of military occupation, settler colonialism and apartheid is implementing a shoot to kill or maim policy against peaceful Palestinian protesters in Gaza, marching for freedom and refugee rights, charitable rhetoric is not enough. It is time for accountability. The EU still votes as a bloc in support of UN resolutions upholding basic Palestinian rights, including the right of return, and condemning Israel's settlements as illegal. But the EU has yet to take effective measures of accountability against Israel. In contrast, significant EU sanctions have been imposed on Russia soon after its military takeover of the Crimea. Despite Israel's descent into unmasked right-wing extremism, particularly with the current escalation of its repression and the EU's rhetoric notwithstanding, the EU, including Ireland, remains largely complicit in enabling and maintaining Israel's grave violations of Palestinian rights. Israel's serious breaches of international law trigger legal obligations for the EU, Israel's largest trade partner, and to its member states. As reiterated in the 2004 ICJ ruling, states must refrain from any act that would entail recognition of Israel's settlement enterprise and from providing any form of assistance to maintaining the illegal situation arising from it. By trading with Israel's illegal settlements and supporting companies that are involved in the settlement enterprise, as defined by the UN, the EU is violating both obligations of non-recognition and non-assistance. The EU, including Ireland, maintains a web of military relations, weapons research, banking transactions and settlement trade with Israeli companies, banks and institutions that are deeply implicated in violating our rights. For instance, the EU imports goods from the Israeli settlements at an estimated annual value of $300 million. Through its Horizon 2020 research program, the EU has approved more than 200 projects with Israeli companies, such as Elbit and Israel Aerospace Industries, that are accused of deep complicity in war crimes and possible crimes against humanity. Another Israeli beneficiary of EU funding is Technion University, a main hub for developing Israeli weapon systems used to perpetrate crimes against Palestinian civilians. Merely labeling some of the illegal products of Israeli colonies instead of banning them is considered by Palestinians as yet another EU failure to uphold European and international law. As Israel's regime becomes more overtly associated with the global far right, including white supremacist and anti-Semitic groups in the United States and Europe, and as it becomes the model for Trump's xenophobic policies, its popularity continues to sink. 
A recent BBC poll shows that Israel has the fourth lowest popularity rating among many countries. Crucially, support for holding Israel to account is growing among Jewish Americans and the broader US public. Israel is intensifying its land grabbing construction of illegal settlements and walls in the occupied territories, including East Jerusalem. It's tightening its fatal siege of two million people in Gaza, denying them basic necessities while counting per capita calories that are allowed in. The UN predicts that Gaza will be unlivable by 2020. Israel is, is entrenching what even the U.S. Department of State once characterized as a system of, quote, institutional, legal, and societal discrimination, end of quote, against Palestinian citizens of present-day Israel, enforced by more than 65 racist laws. It also continues to deny the internationally recognized rights of Palestinians in exile, who account for 50% of all Palestinians. In light of this ongoing Nakba, and given the failure of the international community to hold Israel to account, the nonviolent Nobel Peace Prize nominated Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions BDS movement for Palestinian rights was launched in 2005 by the broadest coalition in Palestinian civil society. It calls for an end to the 1967 occupation, full equality for Palestinian citizens of Israel, and the right of return for Palestinian refugees. Anchored in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, BDS has consistently and categorically opposed all forms of racism and discrimination, including anti-Semitism, anti-black racism, and Islamophobia. One's identity we uphold should never diminish one's entitlement to rights. The BDS movement is supported by near consensus in Palestinian society. Days ago, the PLO, the sole legitimate representative of our people, reiterated its support for BDS. At the most basic level, Palestinians are calling on Ireland, the EU, and the world at large to uphold their profound moral and legal responsibility to do no harm to us. Beyond responsibility, we're asking for solidarity, not charity. In a show of effective and genuine Irish solidarity with the Palestinian struggle, a few weeks ago, Dublin became the first European capital to adopt BDS for Palestinian rights. Derry was the first Irish city in 2016 to endorse BDS. The Irish trade union movement, the student movement, uh, artists, academics uh, across Ireland have adopted BDS in support of Palestinian rights. In response to the impressive growth of support for Palestinian rights, particularly through BDS, and evoking memories of McCarthyism, Israel has since 2014 waged a global war on the movement, including extensive propaganda, legal warfare, and espionage. A desperate Israeli government minister has established a, quote, tarnishing unit to smear Palestinian, Israeli, and international human rights defenders in the BDS movement, while another has publicly threatened us and my name was mentioned in that threat, with targeted civil assassination. Amnesty has condemned those threats. Ireland, along with the EU, Sweden, Netherlands, and others, has upheld the right to call for BDS against Israel to achieve Palestinian rights as a matter of freedom of expression. To conclude, to fulfill Ireland's obligations under international law vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian people, we appeal to you to consider the following concrete measures of accountability. One, imposing a two-way military embargo on Israel, as was done against apartheid South Africa, and as called for by Amnesty International. Two, banning the import of products of companies implicated in Israel's illegal settlements, and ensuring that companies involved in grave misconduct, such as HP and G4S, are excluded from state tendering processes in line with the EU directive on this matter. Three, supporting the suspension of the EU-Israel Association Agreement until Israel abides by its human rights clause. Four, halting all financial transactions with Israeli banks that finance Israel's settlement enterprise. Five, and last, stop considering the import of Israeli natural gas or electric power given Israel's pillage of Palestinian energy resources. To conclude, Yates once said, I have spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly because you tread on my dreams. He also said, in dreams begin responsibilities. Indeed, in presenting my people's dreams and aspirations before you, I sincerely hope that you shall not tread on our dreams of dignity 
emancipation and the just peace, but will act with responsibility to make them come true. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your presentation, a very concise and, and clear outline of the position of your organisation and the issues you want us to, to consider and to put to government. I understand Senator Batchik has commitments in the Shannon, so I'll take your contribution for us to be followed by Deputy Collins. Um, thank, you. thank you very much, Chair, and just to thank you very much, Mr. Barghouti, for, as the Chair said, such a concise and clear presentation, and I think you've set out for us very succinctly why uh, Ireland should support the BDS uh, pro programme, and I'm personally a supporter of it, and uh, proud, ha proud to support it on behalf of Labour as well, my own party, and, uh, and to say that, as you've said, students' unions across Ireland have backed it, as have other unions and, other, uh, and others too, and I think we do need to uh, act on it. I would ask um, on, a, a, on a very much related issue that we've, that we've also heard from uh, about on this committee and that some of us have been working on, the issue of demolition, that these, the demolitions, this sort of systemic demolition of Palestinian, uh, of, uh, Palestinian infrastructure by the Israeli authorities, notably of EU-funded Palestinian infrastructure. So you might just say a word about that because I've always thought that's a strong leverage within the EU for Ireland to, Ireland, for Ireland to take a position in defence, really, of the funding the EU has provided for structures that have since been dismantled or, in, or destroyed by uh, Israeli authorities as part of the illegal settlement programme. So just again to express my support and to thank you for coming here. Thanks, Senator Batchik. Deputy Collins? Yeah, I don't have anything to add. Senator Batchik has just covered the yes. question that I had. And just to thank you for your presentation. Thank you. I'll go back to Mr Bergutti if you want to make a comment, and then I'll, I'll come back to Deputy Barrett and Senator McLaughlin. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, indeed, the issue you raise is extremely important, especially because you mentioned the EU-funded projects. Over the last number of years, Israel has intensified its demolition of Palestinian homes, schools, uh, clinics, uh, uh, just about every infrastructure Palestinians have built, especially in Area C. 60% of the West Bank that's under Israel's military and security control, where Palestinians cannot do anything without Israeli permission. And despite these projects being funded by the EU, and although the heads of missions of EU states in Jerusalem have always raised the facts very clearly to their capitals, there's been zero accountability. Just words, rhetoric of condemnation, even very light condemnation at that, without any action on the ground. Not, uh, not uh, one measure to hold Israel to account or request that it pays back European tax money that's been invested in supporting Palestinian infrastructure. So this, this really raises the question, why is Israel put on a pedestal above international law, as Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa once said, why does it get away with all these violations of international law with no accountability? Um, thanks, Mr. Bergutti. Senator McLaughlin. Uh, th thank you. Apologies. Um, um, my colleague, uh, uh, Deputy Sean Crow, is in the United States on behalf of the committee, so he, he sends his apologies for not being here today. And he's asked me, uh, as a Sinn Féin senator, to. Um, to, uh, to 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 uh, convey those apologies, but also ask some questions, if that's okay. Um, the my, my party of uh, support BDS very much. So uh, I, I would say this that. Um, in Ireland, we're very proud of the Dunstores workers. Many years ago, they worked for the Dunstores here in Ireland, and they took a stand uh, against apartheid in South Africa. Uh, and we celebrate them today because, of course, they were absolutely vindicated. What strikes me is that the boycott uh, campaign internationally uh, against the apartheid regime in South Africa uh, had the successful impact uh, eventually. Uh, it was a successful campaign. It was a way of peacefully uh, conveying uh, our opposition um, to what happened. Uh, and I, I find it remarkable um, the efforts that Israel, the Israeli states have, have gone to with, with some of their allies to undermine what is a peaceful, a peaceful and dignified opportunity for those in the international community to express their opposition to what has happened uh, to the Palestinian people, but also their frustration at their own political leaders for their failure to take decisive action on behalf of the Palestinian people. 
So I, I take this opportunity today. I, I believe that the overwhelming majority of the Irish people are in solidarity with the cause of the Palestinian people. Uh, and I believe that the overwhelming majority of Irish people believe that we should do what is dignified and peaceful uh, to support uh, the, 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 the Palestinian people. So I make that statement today before I, I get to my questions. My questions are this. Um, there was some legislation that we hoped to bring um, through the, the, the second house here in Ireland, the Shannad, in relation to the banning of goods from illegal settlements internationally, which obviously would also include the occupied territories uh, in Palestine. Um, and that legislation has been deferred. Um, and will, I believe, come before the second house later this year. So I want to get your views on that legislation which is around that uh, and, wh and what would that mean to the Palestinian people if that were passed. That's the first question. Uh, my next question is in relation to what has ha been happening in Gaza uh, and the uh, shootings and killings of uh, Palestinian protesters. What is the, what is the mood, uh, what is the sense uh, in relation to that? The imprisonment of uh, Ahid Tamini uh, and other Palestinian children. Um, can we get some sort of a, an update uh, uh, on all of that uh, and what we can do in Ireland uh, in relation uh, to this? Um, I, I, and then just the, 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 the wider issue of um, Jerusalem and the recognition. Uh, of Jerusalem as the Israeli capital by the American um, administration, by the Trump administration. Um, what is the reaction? What is the repercussions in Palestine? What is the current you know, mood amongst the Palestinian? And, and finally, I say this, I'm conscious that BDS is a initiative of the Palestinian grassroots civil society. Um, and, and as distinct from the political leadership, because there hasn't been elections in Palestine for a long time, so how can we really assess who are the political leadership in Palestine if there haven't been actual elections in a long time? But I would certainly look at the Palestinian civic society as being representative of the Palestinian people. And what is the views among civic society of all of these matters? So thank you. Thank you, Chairman, for your patience. Thanks, Senator McLaughlin. Mr. Berkuthi. Um, yes, thank you. I'll try to answer as succinctly as possible the six questions. <laughs> uh, but thank you so much for raising those very important points. And of course, uh, uh, we deeply appreciate uh, Sheen Fein's uh, support for the BDS uh, movement. Um, uh, it's important that you've mentioned South Africa in this context, because Ireland in particular played a leading role in the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement against apartheid uh, South Africa. Although uh, British uh, artists like to think that they were the first, in fact, Irish artists were the first to call for a cultural boycott of South Africa. South Africans and the Palestinians know this history quite well. Um, regarding some of the issues uh, you've raised, indeed, Regardless of the BDS movement, what Palestinians are asking Ireland and other states to do is to fulfill their legal obligations. And this is a key issue connected uh, to the, uh, um, the Control of Economic Activity Bill, which was deferred, as, as you've uh, mentioned, which would prohibit entry into Ireland of products of uh, uh, settlements illegally built in occupied territories, which obviously ap applies to the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, as defined by the United Nations. We think this would be a very basic first step. It does not fulfill all of Ireland's obligations. It's the beginning of fulfilling Ireland's obligations under international law. And we don't buy the uh, pseudo-legal argument made by the Irish government why they're, they're deferring this, saying they abide by EU directives and laws. There's, there, there's absolutely nothing in EU legislation that would prevent Ireland or any European state that's a member of the EU from fulfilling its legal obligations. Uh, those obligations are triggered because settlements in international law are considered a war crime. Building settlements is a war crime, and therefore it triggers legal obligations for all countries. So this is basic international law, and Ireland is obligated uh, by it, and it became part of domestic Irish uh, law, actually, that international law uh, uh, applies in Ireland as well. So that's a very important point. A second point related to that is military embargo. One of the main slogans raised by the tens of thousands of unarmed protesters in Gaza uh, uh, protesting against the siege and for the right of return for 
for refugees is military embargo now. Amnesty has called for a military embargo. That's a basic uh, uh, responsibility to export no weapons to an area of conflict, regardless of what your opinions are on this conflict. Um, now, Ireland claims, the, the state, the government claims that it doesn't have much of a military trade. But uh, some facts we, we've seen show that there is indeed millions of euros being uh, sold in weapons to Israel and bought from Israel uh, in weapons or weapon parts or technology used for weaponry and for military purposes. And this needs to stop because that's the most important, the highest priority demand for the Palestinians everywhere to stop arms trade with Israel. Uh, regarding Ahed Tamimi and other Palestinians, children in Israeli prison, hundreds of Palestinian children. Again, even in the US Congress, where it's really difficult, this issue has been raised. And several congressmen and women have courageously uh, uh, sponsored uh, a bill that would withhold US aid to Israel equivalent to the amount used in detaining, interrogating, torturing Palestinian children. So coming from the US, from the belly of the beast, as it were, this would be a very important move. And, and we hope that Ireland can take similar action, to push the EU to take similar action of accountability, not just condemnation, but accountability on child uh, prisoners uh, in Israeli prisons. Um, the, the Trump administration's Jerusalem embassy move is uh, very dangerous, not just for Palestinians, but for the entire region, if not the world. Uh, Trump is undoing decades of U.S. foreign policy, and he is isolating U.S. policy from the international consensus. Uh, the, you know, the United Nations and the absolute majority of nations around the world do not recognize Israeli sovereignty over any part of Jerusalem, and all of them recognize East Jerusalem as occupied Palestinian territory. So Trump is isolating the U.S., in fact, from this inter international consensus, but in a way he's, he's uh, 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 lighting a keg of powder in a, in a very dangerous way, in a very uh, volatile area to start with. So we think this will empower Israel, will enable Israel to build more settlements, to kill more Palestinians, to arrest more children, uh, and to confiscate more Palestinian land and continue with its ethnic cleansing of indigenous Palestinians, especially in East Jerusalem, to colonize uh, the city. Uh, finally, on civil society and the political uh, leadership, you, you're absolutely right. There has not been any election in, in a number of years uh, for Palestinians. But most recently, the PLO, which still symbolizes the leadership of the Palestinian uh, people everywhere, despite its many problems, and despite many demands to democratize the PLO, has adopted BDS. So even the, the highest authority among Palestinians has adopted uh, BDS. Among civil society, it's a wall-to-wall -wall support for BDS. NGOs, trade unions, women's unions, uh, academics, farmers, unions, every main entity uh, among Palestinians in Palestine, as well as in exile, have adopted BDS as uh, one of the most effective uh, uh, popular resistance movements and as the most effective solidarity uh, movement with Palestinian rights. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Barghouti. Just in, in general uh, terms, um, with regard to the encroaching settlements for some time now, how feasible do you think is the two-state solution now? And in other words, a former foreign minister of our country, Brian Lennon, was the first person in, in the European Union to advocate and to have a distinct policy in regard to that, and it's one that, that's held very strongly in this country. How feasible is it nowadays? Um, in the BDS movement, we do not adopt any position on two states versus one state, because we stick to rights. As a human rights movement, we stick to the basic three rights, ending the occupation, ending the system of apartheid, and the right of return. But my personal opinion is that the two-state solution has not been feasible for quite some time now, especially with the Trump-Netanyahu alliance, the far-right alliance, and the support of the far-right around the world, it's become even less uh, possible than ever before. In reality, we have one state already, one apartheid state, with different rights allocated to different groups, depending on their ethnicity and religion. This was seen as extremely racist and, and, and uh, uh, frowned upon by the entire world when it was the case in South Africa, but it's tolerated by almost all states today around the world while it's happening in Palestine. We do have already a st one state under Israeli control with apartheid uh, laws applying to Palestinians. Even Palestinian citizens of present-day Israel suffer from more than 65 discriminatory laws. 
So even if we forget the occupied West Bank and Gaza, including East Jerusalem for now, we still have a system of apartheid within Israel itself. So I think it's not so feasible. But the, the main point is not theoretical. It is what is needed to push for a just peace. Uh, I think the world is stuck in a dogmatic uh, obsession with two states and one. Uh, and this is not the real issue. The real issue is rights. In the Oslo Accords, the big omission was of human rights. No mention of human rights in the entire Oslo Agreement between the PLO and Israel. So what the world needs to push Israel to, to accept is that they have to meet their obligations under international law and respect Palestinian rights. That's the, the main thing that's missing. And the second point is accountability. Israel has total impunity. It is drunk with power, given Trump's blanket uh, support. Uh, and without accountability, it will not just endanger our very existence as a nation in our homeland, it will endanger the entire region and therefore the world. So could, could I just ask, I bring you in, Deputy Barrett, then. So are you stating then, and I appreciate your speech, answering these, que these specific questions in a personal opinion, that the policy advocated by the European Union, by ourselves as a member state and by other member states, that that policy is obsolete? It is, whether it's obsolete or not, uh, is debatable, but it's certainly a distraction. It, the main point is the EU meeting its obligations to stop enabling and endorsing Israel's crimes against Palestinians. Uh, uh, distracting this very important obligation, distracting our attention from this very important obligation with a, an empty rhetorical political debate about whether two-state is, is uh, the best solution or not, I think uh, does not serve anyone's purposes if, if, if a real just and durable peace is what we all aim to achieve. Yeah, but we would, we would all advocate a two-state solution based on the principle of rights and, and human rights, and, and obviously not just a mantra. The mantra would be, would be meaningless if there weren't the basic human rights and civil rights to follow for all people. Actually, I'm not sure this is very accurate, sir. Uh, in the European Union's discussion of two states, there's no mention today of the basic rights of Palestinian citizens of Israel, for example. Uh, they represent 12% of the entire Palestinian people, and they live under conditions of apartheid with dozens of laws discriminating against them. In the, in the, in the current discussion about a two-state solution, it just says fulfilling the Palestinian right to self-determination by establishing an independent state in the occupied West Bank and Gaza, including East Jerusalem. That's fine. But what do you do with the rights of refugees? 50% of the Palestinians live in exile. Even among Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank, a huge minority are refugees. What do you do with Palestinian citizens of Israel? Without addressing the three rights, no solution will be ethical, and no solution will therefore be sustainable. To be sustainable, it has to be comprehensive. It has to fulfill the basic rights of all Palestinians, not just the convenient part, the 38% who live in Gaza and the West Bank. They're 38% only of the entire Palestinian people. If the EU were serious, they would have to address the basic rights of all Palestinians. Thank you very much, Mr. Bogutti. Deputy Sean Barrett? Yeah, just, uh, I just want to ask the question. Uh, um, how do you, uh, your organization, uh, deal with the Israeli problem? I mean, as an outsider looking in, <clears throat> Israel has, from time to time, changed the, the style of leadership that they have within Israel. And uh, I was thought that the present regime would be least favorable towards the Palestinian situation. That's a, an outsider's view looking in. Um, but at the end of the day, <clears throat> there's no solution to this problem unless we get an Israeli reasonable approach to deal, dealing with the Palestinian problem. So it's one thing condemning Israel. And, you know, uh, I believe that within Israel, and I've been there, and, you know, I believe there is a great deal of sympathy towards the Palestinian situation. But that's not probably reflected in, in the manner in which the present regime go about their business. 
and from time to time, you know, the situation has become fluid because of changes of regimes within Israel. But trying to find a solution to the problem, we can't sort of move with the change of regi regime. I think as a country, uh, where our approach would be, along with the EU, to try and find an overall solution to this ongoing problem. And I'm just interested, I appreciate where you're coming from and what you're representing, but in trying to find a solution to the problem, uh, you know, wise heads are needed and, uh, uh, you know, in the long term and taking polar positions is not going to bring a solution which is to the benefit of the, the unfortunate people who have to live under these circumstances. Um, thanks, Deputy Barrett. Senator McLaughlin, then I'll go back to Mr. Barghouti. Th thank you, Chairman. For, 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 uh, it's just, I, I think the, the discussion about the two-state solution was actually a, a good uh, opportunity for us because in, in Europe uh, and internationally, um, based on the Oslo Accord, we all sub subscribe to the two-state uh, solution and, uh, and the idea of the Palestinian people having their own state, uh, limited as it is, as you've pointed out. But maybe it might be useful for you to, to because I, 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 was, I was in the occupied territories a number of years back and it was a presentation made by a eminent professor, I recall, and he demonstrated to us the actual land that's in the possession of the Palestinian people today. My understanding is about 5% of historical Palestine. So there is no two-state solution, which shocked me to the core when I seen the presentation, in that there's no viable Palestinian state left because we have allowed the Oslo Accord, limited as it was, to be ripped to shreds by occupied uh, territories and by settlements and by carving up the, the territories, the very limited territories that were there. I just would think it would be useful for, to give a testimony, maybe you'd be much better qualified. I, I was based on a presentation a number of years back, but I, I think it would be useful to make that present, or, or sorry, to give some comments about the reality of what is actually in the possession of the Palestinian people today. Thanks, Senator McLaughlin. Mr. Bergutti, I have to go with the Taoiseach is addressing the, the chairs of the various committees, so I have to leave because I have a speaking slot. And I ask Deputy Barrett to take over. Thank you. Excuse me. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, addressing your question, sir. Um, when Ireland was uh, resisting uh, British colonialism, I'm sure no one in Ireland would, would have appreciated then anyone from the outside looking at the British and the Irish as two equal parties involved in some husband-wife conflict where we need a therapist to bring them together and to talk peace. I'm sure the absolute majority of the Irish people were then seeking justice and expecting everyone around the world to hold the British accountable for crimes of colonialism committed in Ireland over centuries and to support the Irish quest for freedom and self-determination. Similarly, Palestinians have sought nothing more than our right to freedom, justice, equality, self-determination. And therefore, what we're asking for is to do no harm, which is not much of a charitable act it's a profound moral obligation to do no harm. By doing nothing, the EU, including Ireland, are doing harm to us. By continuing to support or to be apathetic towards Israeli crimes, the EU, including Ireland, are doing harm. Uh, 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 importing uh, products of settlement goods and companies that are complicit in Israel's violations is doing harm. So we're doing no harm, which is a profound moral obligation, is what we're asking uh, for. Regardless whether the current Israeli regime is the most racist in Israel's history, which it is. Since 2015, Israel has elected its far, the farthest right uh, government ever. Uh, um, the premise that, 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 that you've uh, presented, that there is huge sympathy for Palestinian rights among Israelis, is not borne by empirical facts. In fact, um, 
almost all polls, all studies, all surveys that we've seen in the last number of years show an absolute majority of Israelis supporting the current government, supporting very racist policies, including within Israel itself, not just in the occupied West Bank and uh, uh, Gaza. Uh, uh, a majority of Jewish Israelis today say uh, that they do not want to live next to a Palestinian within present-day Israel, let alone uh, how to deal with the West Bank and Gaza. Again, the point is not to consider this as a conflict of symmetric powers. It's a colonial situation. It's a situation of apartheid, settler colonialism and occupation, and therefore there are obligations that are triggered. Uh, uh, accountability is the most important issue. Of course we need Israelis uh, uh, ultimately to agree on a just peace. Otherwise, we cannot uh, achieve it alone. But how do we get them there? By carrots and more carrots and more carrots. I think the EU has provided tons of carrots over the last decades to no avail. Nothing has happened. The EU has forgotten what a, a stick looks like when it comes to Israel. Whereas with Russia, with China, even with the United States, the EU has adopted sanctions. Over its, the last number of decades, the EU has imposed sanctions on every imaginable power on earth, except on Israel. So when, we, when Palestinians accuse the EU of hypocrisy, of double standard, of putting Israel on a pedestal, we know what we're talking about. There is no accountability. That's the only thing that will entice a majority of Israelis to, to recognize that this is not sustainable. They cannot have their cake and eat it too, maintain their oppression against Palestinians while enjoying free access to the European markets, uh, uh, military trade, and so on and so forth. There is no price being paid by Israel for its crimes against the Palestinians. We think making Israel pay for its crimes is the most important factor that's missing in getting a majority formed in Israel for a just peace, and not just for a rhetorical peace without justice, without Palestinian rights. Uh, on, on the second uh, point, in fact, I, I think the professor you were mentioning has, uh, was referring to Palestinians in Israel, and in fact it's 3%. Palestinian citizens of Israel control 3% only of the land under Israel's control. By law, not just by policy, Israel, through some very convoluted laws and policies, uh, has kept 93% of the land under its control for Jewish development only, which means if you're a citizen of Israel but you're not Jewish, you're not entitled to the same rights as Jewish citizens to buy, lease, live on 93% of the land under Israel's uh, control. This is uh, if we ignore even the West Bank and Gaza. In the West Bank, 60% of the land, the most fertile land with water resources, is controlled by Israel. And that's where the settlements are growing uh, the most. So indeed, uh, the general uh, uh, tendency, as, as you've rightly mentioned, is a shrinking space for Palestinians, shrinking land ownership by Palestinians, and growing colonization of the entire uh, uh, land. So indeed, Oslo has acted as a fig leaf, nothing more than a fig leaf, for very intense colonization of Palestinian land, uh, usurping Palestinian natural resources, uh, uh, and demolishing more and more farmlands, homes, and so on, to make it impossible for Palestinians, the indigenous people of the land, to continue living on most of the land of historic Palestine. So it's becoming less and less uh, sustainable, Gaza being the most extreme case, which is becoming unlivable in a year and a half. Uh, but even in the West Bank, it's not unlivable yet, but it's becoming extremely difficult for Palestinians to sustain any life with encroaching settlements taking over their most fertile lands and, and water resources. Okay. Well, thank you, um, Mr. Berguzzi. Uh, I, I think on behalf of the Joint Committee, I'd like to thank you for your comprehensive presentation and dealing with our questions. Uh, in it, it's a very interesting opportunity for us to meet with people like your good self. We n may not always agree on uh, you know, the pros and cons, but I think we share a common interest, and that is to see peace for the Palestinian people and a, a proper respect for their rights, as well as uh, allowing for Israel 
to coexist also. Um, and, you know, in, uh, in listening to your views, uh, I congratulate you for presenting your approach to uh, what you see as a solution to this problem. Uh, so again, thank you very much for coming to us and uh, enjoy very much your presentation. Thank you very much.